Hey friends, it's Aislinn and Joe, and I am super excited to now have a playlist on the Aislinn Campbell YouTube channel, Dinner Table Talks. Exactly. So while you're here on my YouTube channel, subscribe to Aislinn Campbell. You'll see all the cool stuff I'm putting out. Super cool. And be sure to like this podcast as well. And while you're listening, go over to your favorite podcast platform. You know the whole list. Go wherever you go and like, rate, and subscribe to us there as as well. It helps us out. So pull up a chair, grab your favorite beverage. We have got so much to talk about. Okay, so I asked a random question last week, mm -hmm. and then I didn't do a very good job of answering it <laughs> myself or like having a really good conversation about it. How does that work? You listen back to the podcast and say, uh. Well, yeah, and my mom and I tend to talk about a lot of the things on the podcast. And I knew that as the conversation was going on about the county fairs, that uh -huh. like I wasn't really like forming real thoughts about it and that I hadn't come up with any true statements yet. Mm -hmm. But I kind of got lost in it for some reason. Random questions of the week are like that <laughs> because we really don't know the question ahead of time. Right. right. Wait, hold on. We didn't do a very good job of answering that question. But thing is, is that my whole entire life, I've been involved in county fairs somehow I think that what has ha what happened and what has happened with that is that I've got so many different stories all mixed up together about what was happening where in terms of county fairs and things like that. And what my mom was saying was that the area down here where we are, mm -hmm. there's not really a county fair like the Windsor County Fair in Maine. Right. Or Charlotte's Web. What we have down here is youth county fairs. And the county fair that I participated in down here, the youth county fair, was very small and the group that I participated in was very focused on livestock. We'll come back to this in a second, but I was sitting at Lily's graduation and watching the kids that had a lot of photos that were like FFA groups and just realizing that my two children, my four children with ours together, mm -hmm. weren't involved in any of that really. Mm -mm. And that's odd because of what I am what and who, you were, what I do right. and, and you know, what too. I was involved in. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of things about county fairs besides livestock. That was kind of the, the meat of it. What was funny was that my mom was saying, well, you participated in a lot of the like cooking things and the sewing things and all that I did, but they weren't really involved in the big youth livestock show. That wasn't necessarily something I was involved in. But one of the things that you can see that is the difference between the county that I grew up in and the big county, Nueces County, is that there's so many activities because there's so many kids that want to get involved in those projects over there and the schools are encouraging more kids to get involved there may be people listening to the podcast that are like, huh? <laughs> because they're Even so though, urban. They're not involved in any of that kind of county fair stuff. I looked up the Windsor County Fair in yes, Maine that yes, you said that, that you've been to. We took Cortland to that when he was 10. Harness racing, giant pumpkin contest. I saw that. And my mom reminded me that up in the county that we lived up in Bernie, which was Kendall County, uh -huh. they actually did have multiple county. They had the big county fair and then they had the youth livestock show. Right. I just can't remember that stuff because I was pretty young when we left Bernie. I was in the fourth grade when we left Bernie. Well, you and I need to get ourselves to a county fair, a proper county fair, and definitely in January go to that livestock show here in Nueces County. I think I have like emotional trauma connected with livestock shows. Like I really do. Like it's probably the part of, it's probably a bigger reason why my kids weren't involved in it than anything else. The story I told you about going to that often in middle school, uh -huh. there is emotional trauma because at the end of it, when all those animals that everyone raised are being carted off and the hogs are being taken away and, the, and they know they're going to slaughter, there's a bunch of crying kids. Oh God, that never affected me trauma wise. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, what affected me trauma wise was the mothers. <laughs> That being said, yeah. this morning... <laughs> yes, mom? <laughs> exactly. This morning, I got to go see my daughter at their senior award ceremony. Right. So basically, they do all that award giving away and make sure they've got all their tassels and their cloaks and all the different things that they wear, cloaks, whatever, mm -hmm. <laughs> all the things they wear, tags and medals and like all this like accoutrement that they wear <laughs> yep. to graduation these days. Mm -hmm. So my daughter's graduating from high school tomorrow night. You guys have been through three graduations with us here on the podcast, and you'll be with us with another kid going to college mm -hmm. here in the next uh, few months. The adventure never ends. It's an interesting dinner table when you've got this kind of like 
uh, machine going through every couple of years or yep. whatever. Like, Welcome to the dinner table when we have no kids anymore. That'll be a couple of years away. And while I have no real predictions about what's going to be happening in the next five years, because I think that we are coming into a complete and total shift in everything, mm. I can imagine that if we did this podcast for 10 years that we will see grandbabies on this podcast. Oh, but it's got to be 10 years from now. You keep, I'm extending. Every time you say I just, it, it's Another 10 years year goes by, and I just say, like, in another decade. I mean, you know, 53. Grandma at 53. I think I can handle that. I can handle that. I can handle that. <laughs> oh. Unanswered questions. Pronounce this word for me. The American version, H-E-R-B-S. Herbs. That's the English version. <laughs> That's the dinner That was going to be version. my next question. I actually always say herbs. We in America say herbs. In England, they say herbs. Same thing with salves and salves, except that in America, both of them are in common use. There is no right answer. There is no wrong answer. Because I was thinking, I, I literally was thinking about comfrey salve and i'm pretty sure that as i go to all of these conferences where farmers are trying to learn how to sell different types of herbs and plants and all the kinds of things and they're making different things and they're teaching you how to make things i think they're saying salve because they unless may, i have they like probably are. completely created a figment in my imagination where uh -huh. there's uh, uh -huh. where i say the words everyone else is saying salve you know what you like, bring up a very interesting point uh -huh. you said you get because you're doing a salves tinctures and tonics yes. class coming up with cassie benetchik the untinged homesteader and after you talked about it last week i said you keep saying salves but my whole life i've said salves i think both of us probably postured up to one of us is right and one of us is wrong when we are both correct yes how often does that happen in everyday life every day million times a day. Now, tell me more about this class. Uh, so my friend Cassie and I put on two classes prior to this class is coming up on June the 19th. Mm -hmm. And it was called Farm Forage for Health and Wellness. And Cassie is a studying naturopath. Okay. She's studying naturopathy so that she can help families with healing and wellness using plant medicine and all of those types of things that you know I'm into. Right. And understanding the way our bodies work. She's and, really good at making selves. Exactly. Or said. These classes went so well. We went around the farm. We looked at all the different types of weeds, which in our climate, where we have a lot of water, a lot of humidity, we also have land that has been in farmland and or livestock land. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of medicinal and edible weeds. Here. Lots. Gotcha. Not just our property, but like in property all across South Texas, near, near the coast, especially. It's the reason why we have so many birds here. It's, you know, we have a lot of stuff here. And so what she's doing is trying to just give people other options in case there was ever an emergency where you're looking to solve a problem really quickly with some sort of health issue that's going on in your home. Mm -hmm. She taught you things about some of the culinary herbs that most people are growing in their gardens. Right. And then we walked around and we tasted different weeds. And then there's this one little weed. It looks like a clover, actually. It's okay. got the, the leaves like a clover. Like if a kid saw it, they'd say, oh, it's clover, whatever. But it's got these little seed pods on it. And the seed pods are like sweet little tarts. And I want to say, we'll have to come back to this with an unanswered question. But she taught everybody about this plant. And then it was the rural kids that were involved in it were like, oh, yeah, we used to eat that when we were kids. You know, so I'm sure there's people listening to this podcast could name weeds they ate as little kids. You're playing around. Remember when you used to pick up a piece of grass and you'd whistle with it? Of course. And we tasted things and we ate things. Our friends told us, eat this. That's gross. You know, th th we did that kind of stuff when we were little digging in the dirt. So we did that. And it was so much fun. But people were like, okay, now how do we make these things? Okay. Because she was going through tinctures? saying, that's a such and such plant. In a tincture, you can use it for whatever. Yes. The and natural, a salve. The, salve. the <laughs> natural progression is, well, teach me how to make the next step. Exactly. That's what this class is. That's exactly what's coming up. So Very we're nice. doing that on June the 19th. We're selling tickets right now online. So if you're interested in that, go check out acelandcampbell.com. I changed my thought process about the pickle pop unanswered question. Huh. Okay. Last week we discussed how when I go to the store, I'll typically ask you, what would you like for me to get for you? Anything from the store? And you said, salty dip, salty snacks. Yeah. I need salt. Yeah. Found those pickle pops. Get them. I love pickles. I like pickle pops. Like I don't even need the cucumber. I just need the juice. <laughs> <laughs> but then last week we looked at that ingredient list. 
filtered water, vinegar, salt, natural flavoring. As you said last week, that's just kind of unknown territory. Filtered water, vinegar, salt. Got it. Okay. Now what? What's all this other crap? Okay, here we go. <laughs> Polysorbate 80. F- An emulsifier. Right. That is going to bring together water and oil so that ice cream is smoother or a popsicle freezes correctly. Yeah. FD and seed number five, which of course is an FDA approved food dye to keep that pickle pop as green as you expect it to be. I find that fascinating that that comes up because I wrote a quote in my, I have this little notebook on my phone Mm -hmm. where I write quotes and I've begun getting better at writing it down there first because I need to like think about it sometimes before I like push it out, out there into the universe as Aislinn's words. Especially when we live in this whole council culture thing where it's like you could have said something 20 years ago that mm-hmm. someone could still... And we tried to teach this to our kids when they were very young. Like in the Facebook world or in the social media world, you your words become permanent even if you were an idiot when you said them. Right. <laughs> like it's even the if you story had a momentary of your lapse of judgment, even in right. a moment of anger, even... A, yeah. So I make notes and now you're going to get to hear one of those notes. Okay. I do not consider the FDA a trusted advisor of anything much less would we have given them permission to control. Now, have you changed your opinion in the years since you posted that? No. Okay. I mean, like, even more so. I'm like, just because the FDA approved... I'm like, I'm sitting here going, oh, the FDA approved it? How do I not do that? Sodium benzoate, potassium sorbate. That scares me because isn't, like, benzo, isn't that a bad thing? (laughs) (laughs) Those benzos will mess you up. (laughs) Those are both preservatives. Glycerin, used to make soap. Guar gum, xanthan gum, those are texturizers, those gums. And it got me thinking about the next question that we're going to answer this week. And that conversation that we tend to have often, both here at the dinner table with our friends and privately, about the spectrum. Yeah. And everything is a spectrum. Everything. So on one end of the will I eat processed foods, you've got don't care, of course. Yeah. You've got never will. One of Michael Pollan's food rules, if it has more than five ingredients, don't eat it. You know, Mm -hmm, that kind of thing. mm -hmm. So I bought you more pickle pops Mm -hmm. as promised. Mm -hmm. I haven't eaten any of them yet. So that's a good like indicator that I'm like balancing out. We have on previous episodes gone through, I think, every single one of these. What does this mean when it's on the ingredient list? I don't care to do that again. Uh Just know that it is... Either chemically created or a natural product synthesized chemically. So what I should be doing is asking my mom, that's my greatest fan on this podcast, and she says salves, by the way. Mm -hmm. She's right. (laughs) To make me some pickled pops. When she's making pickles, make me some pickle pops. So here's my question for you. When I picked up those pickle pops Mm -hmm. the first time, Mm -hmm. and I turn it over, Mm -hmm. and I read these ingredients, Mm -hmm. which I didn't do. Then how did you know it was safe Look, for look me? at the front of it, all of the other keywords that mean nothing. Natural like and... Super pops. Yeah. Sports drinks. Well, no, sports drinks I wouldn't have ever bring home like a oh Gatorade. Oh, But it's the same thing. Well, it's the same marketing concept. We're replacing the electrolytes in your body. Yeah. But considering reading polysorbate 80, sodium benzoate, potassium sorbate, should I next time not even bring that anything with that kind of stuff on at home? Is that where we are on the spectrum? Yes. Yes, because the thing is, is that I'll, I'll eat some stupid rainbow colored Skittles, not like regularly, like I'm not a regular eater of that stuff, but I'm like, I'll eat it even though I'm like, dude, this is going to make me sick. Knowingly. Yeah. Just, you know, and I'm on the like into the spectrum where I don't just pick up shit and eat it. I skip by things, but I will eat it and it's not good for me. So ever. you're going to solve this problem. By enlisting your mom to make an all-natural pickle pop. (laughs) I probably need to solve this problem by finding different ways to ingest sodium when I need sodium in the summertime. Will you eat the pickle pops that I bought since? And maybe it's more than sodium that I need. Maybe there's like all kinds of minerals that I need. And here's the thing. One of the things that I did wrong, but it was an experiment, which is an interesting experiment is that I stopped taking my supplements for like two weeks Mm. because I had this like momentary thought where I was like, is this really working? Is this a waste of money? Is this actually doing anything for me? Yeah. And then two weeks later- You fasted from them. Oh my God. I was like having all the problems. Okay. And I was like, dang it. And then- I hadn't even like clued into it because I was so lost in my confusion of like not feeling good 
that it took my mom saying that someone else had had experience like this. And I went, like, oh my God, that's exactly what I've done to myself. I've literally made myself sick by taking away all of the different types of minerals that I had been giving my body. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even like good at it. Like I'm not consistent about anything. I didn't take them last night because I was asleep when I went to go get in bed. I take my supplements right before I go to sleep at night. Why? Because that's how my body processes them the best. Okay. Because if not, then I get up the next day and I take them throughout the day. Well, first of all, I can't take them until after I've decided to eat in the you know afternoon or two o'clock or whatever, whenever I've decided to eat that day. So I can't take them until that point anyways. And then if you think about everyone that takes supplements knows there's certain supplements that make you burp a little bit. Yeah. There's certain supplements that maybe cause your bowels to not, you know. So for me... <laughs> your my, bowels to not, you know. You know, uh, you know. You know what the bowels do and don't do. Let's right? leave it there. Yeah. So what I've found is for my body, a good time for me to take my supplements is right before I go Works to bed. Works for you then. Long enough to like water, take a lot of water, make sure they get all the way down. Mm-hmm. Like they're not stuck in there when I go to sleep. Yeah, that you doesn't know? feel good. No. And then I go to sleep. Although there's probably plenty of people out there that would be like, oh no, you're like setting your stuff off and now it's all working really hard overnight. And I'm like, all right, well, maybe I like it working really hard overnight. I don't know. My point about all of that is that I'm not super consistent about taking it. But the thing is, is it's no different than my plants, feeding my plants. And I saw someone post the other day, oh my God, who knew when you feed your plants, they're so happy. Right. When you give your plants good things. <laughs> yes. Well, your body is the same thing. And I tell you guys that all of the time. And that is our bodies are the same as the plants. And we can watch our plants wilt and, and become kind of sad and kind of droop. And then all of a sudden they're like, tomatoes have blossom bottom rot because they don't have enough calcium. And if you think about that, that's literally what's happening to your body when you're not giving your body the minerals that it needs. And I am one of those people that because I've been studying my body for such a long time, I know when my body is struggling with something that it's time for me to start looking for the options. It's like, okay, well, my body is struggling with anemia right now. It's not right now, but that's one of the things that I find myself being able to figure out. It's kind of a cyclical thing with you. Yeah. It's yes. And it also, I can taste it on my tongue. Mm. I can like, I know my body's. It's time to give my body that iron that. Yeah. With you. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So. I think the spectrum would fit into the next question. The question last week that was asked was, what's the first thing you would do to begin creating the network of information and people in your life to eat more healthily after our conversation about the five main reasons why the profession of medical chef is growing? It's the same answer that I gave years ago when I started the farmer's market and all that. And it is surround yourself with people that want to live that kind of life. If you want to live that kind of life, you have to do the work and you have to surround yourself with people that do it. And you have to take it one bite of the elephant at a time. So it's, okay, well, I'm going to do this one thing that's going to make me feel better. Mm -hmm. And then tomorrow I'm going to do one more thing. Some people are going to do better with like cold quits on things. And some people are going to do better with consistency and habitual. I did it for 40 days. So therefore now I can do it for as many days as I want to, you know, different things like that. Different people adapt their coding in different ways. I would say, and maybe everyone that's that's with us at the table today can't do this because of a geographical limitation, but you have got to be... I hate those kind of outs. You have got to begin. If it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. I guess you could create it. It's exactly what I did. You've got to get involved in a farmer's market. If you want it, you have to create it. Okay, but if it has been created where you live, you've got to go there. And you got to do it. Just like you said, you've got to commit to it. Now, the reason why I'm sending you to the farmer's market is, to me, it's the easiest place to find a community of people just like you're talking about. That's true. But I would also say in terms of like our conversation that we've been involved in a farmer's market for however many years. Sure. And just because you're involved in a farmer's market doesn't mean you're living the lifestyle of the people that are involved in a farmer's market. No, that's not the purpose of the question. The purpose of the question is maybe I'm not living that lifestyle. How do I begin? How do I surround myself and get a network of people like that? I think you're going to find it easily at the farmer's market. Now, here's my proof. Zip code data sure did become a big dang deal for us. And we would notice how often I just moved here. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, well, let me introduce you to this farmer. Oh, what, oh you want some whole milk? Let me introduce you I always think that that had to more to farmer. do with the type of community that comes to a farmer's market, which is... That's exactly what I'm talking but about. But that's not always necessarily about the... the... I didn't poo-poo the one thing you said. Why are you poo-pooing the one thing that I said? Well, because I've been there and I'm like, I don't know that that's the answer. Okay. So don't go to the farmer's market. No, Never mind. No, I'm not saying don't go to the farmer's market. I'm saying you got to take more responsibility than even that. You've got to do the work I and you have a, to surround yourself with people that are doing the work. I think it's a great first step and you should listen to me. Savs. It's one of those rare weeks where the main dish of the week wasn't great. Wasn't bad, but wasn't great. I brought it to the table today because I think it's a great starting point for a dish that we can evolve into something that's a little better. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you how it went down. You weren't in the mood to have our conversation. What do you think we should do for dinner? <laughs> so I said, baby, I'll take care of it. Yay. So, so Solve I, all my problems. <laughs> so I got home and looked in the freezer and saw that stew meat. I said, stew, that's easy because you're pulling potatoes. You're pulling carrots. I can make a, such an easy beef stew. Mm -hmm. Traditional. Mm -hmm. But then I Kinda opened the drawer. No, that's what it is. And then I opened the drawer. No, no, no. Those, that night was very pleasant. That was no, one of those two or true. three pleasant. We got some rain, yes, by the way. Did. You didn't mention that. We did talk about it on the Facebook page because you went live with the chickens on a rainy day. That's right. So I opened the produce drawer and staring at me is half a head of broccoli and half a head of cauliflower. Yep. So I Google beef stew with cauliflower and broccoli. Asian beef and broccoli, Asian beef and broccoli, Asian beef and broccoli. I wanted to do it in the Instant Pot so it wouldn't take too long. One pot dish, your Instant Pot. Brown the stew meat, pull it out, cook your onions. I saw you had a couple peppers. I put those in there. Then I add some of our chicken broth. It asks for beef broth, but I made chicken broth. So that's what I used. Soy sauce, brown sugar, a little bit of sesame oil, and then your vegetables. Now the recipe calls for broccoli. It's beef and broccoli, but I added the cauliflower as well. Mm -hmm. A couple of your eggplants, several of your carrots. It's kind of, I dumped, you know, mm -hmm. we're dumping right now because you're pulling so much out of the garden. I noticed there was one of those bright red carrots. Carrot? Red? Carrots yeah, aren't like red? Yeah, red. Not like, not the purple ones, not the purple red ones, not those. I know a lot of people listening. These are a little bit different. They're kind of thin and long and they're bright red, mm -hmm. like tomato red, bright red. Sliced anything I could that made sense for like an Asian inspired dish. Made a little side of rice. Boom, we're done. Everything was cooked perfectly, but those flavors weren't there. It, was, it, it wasn't spicy enough. That's it wasn't spicy fix. enough, yeah, just generally. The heat wasn't spicy enough. Okay. The, the spices weren't spicy enough. The salt wasn't salty enough. It like wasn't, you know, wasn't there. It needed to be bigger and bolder all yeah. around. Yeah. But it was cooked well. Yes. And it smelled amazing. It really like both did. of us, yeah. me and Savannah both were like, mmm, smells good. Mm. You know, like whatever it is, it smells delicious. I picked up that broccoli and cauliflower once a week for the last four weeks at the farmer's market from yeah. one of our newly emerging favorite vendors there. Wiley Farm is what they're called. I think you're right. Yeah. We're getting to know them really well and I'm, I'm eager to get to know them a little bit better. But I noticed this week. They didn't have any broccoli or yeah. cauliflower. Yeah. We're done with broccoli and cauliflower. Yeah. So I won't even duplicate this dish until nine, ten months from now. Yeah, probably. But I will post it. So go to our Facebook page and you will find it there. I know that all of our friends at the dinner table have probably figured out that I love to have philosophical conversations. Mm-hmm. And that I love to get to know new philosophers and people that are talking about philosophy and studying religion and studying law and psychology and the Bible and new age metaphysical, just like... Throw in other religious texts as well. All, yeah, exactly. In fact, when you met me, I had a bookshelf of books that I had read that were like every kind of religion. Sure. Um, so this is something that I've been studying and researching this kind of philosophy concept that I've been studying for a long time. Can I interrupt you and just <laughs> tell an anecdote that leapt to mind? I went to Baylor University in Waco, Texas. Uh -huh. That's a Southern Baptist university. And with as many friends as I had at Southern Methodist University and other schools with a religion in their name, those schools weren't really religious. Baylor was religious. Baylor had required chapel for two semesters. 
required Old Testament and New Testament. You you know, and a lot of parents like sending their kids there because they think that they're sending their kids to this like summer camp, like youth camp type atmosphere where there's a just an overflow of religion. And I remember taking, I remember wanting to take a world religions class and being dissuaded from several fraternity brothers that were like, no, it's bullshit. That class is bullshit mm-hmm. because it's under the guise of the, these are lesser, ours is superior. Mm-hmm. So I didn't take it. But I have really enjoyed learning more about all of the world religion, how they started, where they came from, where do they get their laws, where do they get their stories. That's fascinating to me. I mean, like I read an entire book. Well, first of all, I read like two or three books on the Quakers. Mm. Like Quakers is actually a religion that I very much could align with. Yeah. Just the way that they live out things. Whirling dervishes. I mean, like I've looked into read books about all kinds of religions sure. and things. And, and I haven't read all of the sacred texts, but I've read a lot of sacred texts. Mm-hmm. And I've read as much as you can understand different types of sacred texts. Of course, I've read the Bible and studied the Bible a lot, you know, back more in my... 20s and younger, you know, and recently I have begun listening to someone that has pretty much been canceled, but also still doesn't give a flying flip whether he's been canceled or not. Canceled a few times, moved past canceled, like just keep moving past canceled. And part of the reason is because he did. I think that's the appropriate attitude to have if you ever are canceled, by the way. I I would think for myself. Well, he went into a whole thing that I was listening to today Mm -hmm. about how before he got canceled the first time. He was teaching people how to voice their opinions and protect their livelihoods. Mm -hmm. You've got to have three types of cash flow and income, and we're going to get your CV in order and make sure you tell your family and, you know, all of these types of things. And so he was actually prepared before he even got canceled the first time for the cancel when it was coming because he was speaking truths that he knew there's an entire force of people that will just say, no, you're not allowed to say that. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to talk about that. Where I got into him, because the thing that I find when you're clicking things is that they're going to use, like we've talked about Russell Brand. Russell Brand is a great example of someone who's Titles of his he YouTube sensationalizes stuff the headline is not at all what he's talking about. The headline is clickbait. Yeah, I kind of got the fear that that was a little bit of what I was dealing with with the first initial things that I was seeing that were coming across my feed from Jordan Peterson. And so I would listen to a few of his things where I was like, dude, I don't want to get into that politics. No, I'm not interested in listening to that. No. Right. And then the initial phases of my understanding of this person is like, I don't think I agree with his politics. So I'm not going to listen, you know, whatever. But then he started talking about sovereign freedom. What is sovereign freedom? Well, I talk about sovereignty a lot because I believe that sovereign is what we are as beings, And in the grander picture of our alignment with God and all the things that I believe about God, I believe we are sovereign. What he was talking about was that in this sovereignty, what we haven't discovered about freedom is that freedom is more about responsibilities of the actions you take and less about the right to do something. So if you're going to take on a freedom, sovereign freedom, you have to be willing to take on the responsibility of the actions that you take sure. and, the, and the consequences that come out. Sure. This is a thing I talk about. It happens with a lot with free speech. You mm-hmm. have the freedom to say it, but you may have to deal with the consequences if you say something so unpopular that people exactly. don't like. Exactly. But you exactly. did have the freedom to say it. Exactly. Exactly. Because of that, I had not been really much into this philosopher, this psychologist this right and so then i started he didn't hit you right at the beginning of the relationship right I'm with probably you. because i had created a figment of my imagination about this particular person that i didn't know anything about i that's where i started paying attention then i started listening to him talk about different types of studies of the bible and just other types of things that i found really fascinating so today i started listening to him talk to an atheist they're having a philosophical conversation this really really good in-depth physical meeting of the minds conversation between an atheist and someone who has over time through all of the things he's learned changed his feeling about theism right whatever right. whatever is the opposite of atheist mm-hmm. right a theist a theist mm-hmm. right exactly <laughs> so but he made this quote right at the beginning of the conversation that tied back to everything i've been talking about lately so i posted it on facebook today okay and the quote is i think honestly 
they have confused me with a figment of their imagination. And my thing was, if everyone understood that about everyone else, and if everyone understood that about themselves, then we can begin the communication again. We used to be able to talk, not necessarily because we knew that someone had another idea about us inside their brain that is different than our vision of ourselves inside our brain and our mother's version of us inside their brain and our best friend's version of us inside their brain. Even before we had any concept of that kind of conscious thought about self and, you know, these things that we're looking at now, Mm -hmm. when we're awakening or beginning to look at these things in a different way now, we had the ability to have a conversation with somebody where we can come to the table and completely disagree about something without canceling you immediately because we've created inside our mind that we can't even listen to what you're saying because we know who you are already before you've even opened your mouth. Mm -hmm. And basically, I just told you that that is exactly the way I felt about Jordan Peterson before I had studied anything about him or listened to him talk or given him a chance, you know? So I could have very well and have very well in my lifetime canceled all kinds of people that like, why did I cancel that person? They, they actually had some really good thoughts that helped me break through some of the things I'm trying to discover about myself. I may not agree with 100% of it. Oh, yeah. I don't agree with 100% of anything anyone says. Right. Even myself. That's not a joke. What was interesting about that particular quote is that not so much of like where he was going and the conversation he was having with that person about that particular thing, but it resonated with me, resonate at a tone, a sound that I am prepared to and in alignment with hearing right now. And that is, I'm having this feeling of being on the outside. Like I've been making posts about, I don't fit in. I'm an outsider. Savannah and we've been talking about the concept of being a teenager and being on the inside and the outside and you graduate from high school and now you're going to be on the outside of this world, but you're on the inside, you know, and so this whole concept of... And then your first job, same thing. And then... Where do I fit in? And then you begin to run into situations where like, sometimes I'll tell you about like my depression or some of the feelings I have about you know, being really down and thinking, oh, those people are talking badly about me and all this kind of stuff. These, this figment of imagination that I have created about myself inside my own brain telling you these things. And you're like, and you've done this all the time that we've known each other, except for when we're in a fight, when we're in a fight, you, 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 you help me, you help me talk shit about myself. (laughs) But when we're not in a fight, you are, you are one of my biggest fans and you are saying, Aislinn, that's not at all how I see you. I'm just going to let that go, by the way. Yeah, just keep, let it go. Keep, keep going. Just let it go. Keep going. Just let it go. Sure. That's what we're supposed to do. Uh, let it Let it go. Right. <laughs> but, the, but that concept, like you do, you have said to me so many times, I didn't know that about you because that's not how I see you. Like, I don't, like, it does, like, what do you mean? Yeah. And I don't really know a great example of that right now, but just, you know, well, everyone, everyone's talking bad about me. I think what it's your high you decibel mean? farting. <laughs> Huh? No. <laughs> but the thing is, is that one of the times he's just more jokes. Come on. Go ahead. No, I'm just teasing you. No, it's good. <laughs> You're laughing at yourself, laughing oh, at yourself. Hell yeah. yeah, exactly. I'm working through a couple of things that it's not time to talk about because I haven't even figured it all out yet by any stretch of the imagination. But one of the things that we've talked about on this show a lot is my performance mode. That is all consuming, that it is difficult for me to break out of. And my impression of other people's impression of my performance mode is a figment of my imagination. Right. Like what you That's see about yourself. That's the first thing I thought of when you brought this up just now. Yeah. What you see about yourself is absolutely different than what someone else sees about sure. you. And they're both figments. Sure. And the thing that I'm coming to terms with, trying to, is that just because it is my figment of my imagination about me, that's a lot of autonomy right there. That doesn't mean I'm right. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean I'm right. Yeah, because sometimes when I say I'm outside, I'm whatever, I'm sitting over there by myself thinking nobody likes me, Mm -hmm. when really what is potentially happening is Maybe they're scared because I'm such a loud voice out in the world 
running for mayor was a huge thing for me to be able to begin to see like, what is the figment that other people have created about me? You know, sure. what is it that they believe I am, which has nothing to do with what I am. Right. But then on the other side of it, it's like and someone if you are... coming along and being like, you're Aislinn. And that has happened many times. Like, oh, you're Aislinn. And I'm like, what do you mean I'm Aislinn? And, and I have begun to adopt more of that into my mindset. Like say to my, oh, it's not that they don't like me. It's that they're, they're intimidated. Right. That, that maybe I won't like them, the you know, or whatever. Br bringing up a political angle to it's a good idea and that i think it's very applicable to this concept and that is this person's running for mayor or whatever mm -hmm. she's gonna make you eat food from the farmer's market that's literally something someone said about me she's gonna make you do that i'm gonna make you eat food open from your mouth <laughs> what is that anyway. i can't even make my kids eat food from the <laughs> farmer's market how am i gonna make you eat food from the Ooh, farmer's market well you would have wielded all of the power of that city gavel oh my god that's such big power <laughs> right those people do a lot of powerful things <laughs> um but the moment that people have an impression of you in a political spectrum based upon an advertisement or based upon your hair color or based upon your gender or based upon your skin color or based upon that person looks like me, they must believe like me. And then yeah. whenever she, or they, they don't look like me, they must not believe like me. Yeah. I sat in front of a man during the campaign asking for money. And he said to me, I've heard you're a liberal. You have a nose ring. Yeah. I mean, like literally. Right. He said those words to me. And I was like. My knowledge of you. I have purple is hair. Is a figment of my imagination. It's exactly. A figment of my imagination. And I know you to be liberal about some things. I know you to be I'm very conservative about some things. certainly a liberal things. type of parent about parenting styles mm -hmm. compared to the rest of the world. Yeah. Well, the rest of the world that we know. Exactly. Yeah. The figment of the imagination. And, and that's the thing that's happening with me is that I'm sitting there trying to understand in the midst of these screaming arguments that never get us anywhere. How are we not able to have even a conversation anymore. And the reason we're not even able to have the conversation anymore is because we're not owning up to the idea that we have literally made up. And sometimes the part that's being made up inside our mind is manipulated by the media stream. And it goes through this filter, this series of spectrums about everything in our own mind and we spit the information out at the end based upon the little bit that we know. And about I do sides. That, I do that all of the time. Mm -hmm. We all do. Oh, sides. Everything has to be distilled down by someone for me so that I know which side to take. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm seeing everywhere. Mm -hmm. All over the place. And the thing is, is that what I'm trying to say to people is, you are standing at a mirror, pointing at yourself in the mirror with the figment of imagination that you see on the other side of the mirror. And... Stand in the mirror and point at yourself in the mirror. You get the opposite. You literally get the opposite. You get... When you, you get, look in the mirror, you don't see what everyone else sees. You see the opposite of you it. You see the reflection of it. Right. I part my hair to the left, but everyone sees it parted to the right. That's exactly right. And so when we're talking about sides and where I can see it, it's right there. I can see that they are on the left side. That what they see is that you're on the left side. Mm-hmm. You see? And so we've got this illusion inside of our mind and we're literally fighting with ourselves. We're literally killing ourselves. And no one, which is what Jordan Peterson is trying to say, will take responsibility for it. Which in some way, I didn't know that this is what I've been saying for many, many years, but it is, I'm going to start taking responsibility for my own wellness. I'm going to ta start taking responsibility for my own finances. I'm going to start taking responsibility. And that responsibility can come in all different ways. But the only way, the only way that we can begin to have real conversations where we can feel safe enough to take responsibility for what we're, we're going to say to someone else is if we know that we're safe enough to understand they don't really know me. They know what they see, what they see based on their coding of me. The, their figment of your imagination about you. And I find this to be such a really, And vice versa. Right. This is like, this is the, like I did communication studies. I always wonder because 
media and marketing and public relations and all the things that I did like, but the fact of the matter is, is it talking, having these philosophical conversations where we can't find out what the middle ground is. If we're just pointing fingers at ourselves in the mirror middle ground and killing make each money. other. Middle ground doesn't make money. Oh God, that's exactly the truth. Mm -hmm. And the thing about Even it though is, we're all on the middle ground, pick the issue. Pick the issue, your favorite one, and look at real polling data. We are in the middle ground. There are always outliers. There's no real polling data, Joe. I know, you're right. <laughs> Even that in itself is like a figment of our imagination. Completely agree. Every single... Thing that we're talking about anymore. And this is the reason why I'm constantly going around going, that's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie. Because it's all a figment of our imagination. And you say so often that people don't understand what I'm saying. You said it about the food stuff. Well, people are starting to begin to understand the food stuff a little bit better. I'm now. just going to let that go. That's not exactly what no. I said. I'm just okay. Well then explain, go. please. Let's open that conversation. I up. think that your idea of how well people perceive all of your ideas is a figment of your imagination. Well, I told you that if I was to And sit mine too, and anybody else's. Sure. I'm not picking on you. Sure. Okay. But, but you have said things like, because I come home so frustrated and you're like, baby, they just don't quite understand what you're saying. Like right. they're not there with you. I find myself being in that boat often- and I ask questions and I ask questions and I ask questions because I want to understand. See, not even like opposing points of view. That's not even what we're talking about. A new point of view. Mm -hmm. Some new philosophy. Yes. A thing you've been given by whomever, wherever, however. Yeah. You want to chew on that bone. Yes. And that's I want to sit right next down to you and chew on the bone. And you know what? There's a lot of what I'm saying that isn't fully formed thoughts yet and isn't researched enough yet. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth about... One of the things that Jordan Peterson actually mentioned recently was like, you can't even have a conversation about the Bible when you're posting something on Facebook about the Bible because you haven't done enough research to even know what you're talking about yet. Oh, and no, you know everything about the Bible when you post about the Bible. What are you talking about? Well, okay, so... Not you. I mean, do you understand my point? So my next comment was, good Lord, if I sat down with Jordan Peterson, he would rip my ass to shreds. And you know what I need to do? I need to get better at letting someone rip my ass to shreds because I haven't done enough research. That's the responsibility. If you're going to share a message, then you need to be willing to sit there and listen to somebody give you their figment of their imagination view of what you're saying to them and dig into the meat of whether you've even read books about Quakers, you know? And that's the thing when you sit down to have those conversations with people and you start to dig in, you begin to discover, like, I'm here having an argument with somebody who has studied their whole life about this particular subject. We need to chew on the bone together rather than fight over the bone. Well, I'm not fighting over the bone anymore. I'm leaving the bone behind if I have to fight over it. I mean, really, I am moving in a direction on social media. I don't, fo I don't follow people anymore. Because if all you're doing is sharing a bunch of memes about the newest crisis, which is going to come next week. Yeah, there'll be a new one tomorrow. That's right then you have nothing to say and I'm changing your station. I'm not watching your media stream anymore. And it's shocking to me how many people whose opinions I actually value. I'm like, you have nothing left to say anymore. You're saying the exact same thing where you're standing in the mirror, pointing at yourself in the mirror and screaming hateful things at yourself. And you are screaming at the other side the exact same way they're screaming at you. There well, while you pray for peace? There is no responsibility being taken by anyone and until we raise our hands and say, I am responsible for the figment in my imagination that I have made out of you. So let's sit down at the table and have a conversation about it and hold each other responsible for our freedoms to choose to do what we want. And I use those words because people that listen and are at the dinner table with us regularly know these are the things I've been talking about all of these times until we raise our hand and say, I am responsible. I will hold myself responsible. Now, what are we going to do together to solve these problems where we sit at the table and we literally don't agree about everything?
but you don't even necessarily know what you really believe in because you haven't even done enough research to understand where did that belief come to in you? Is it a cultural belief? Is it a DNA belief? I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but maybe we'll throw it out there just so that we could go down it another day. And that is, I'm sitting there telling you, you convinced yourself at some point, somewhere down the line that you were going to be bald. And guess what you got to be? You got to be bald. And we all came to agreement that he must come from a family DNA that does is bald, you know, and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it's even easier in most people's scenarios to say that because they can actually look at their lineage and go, well, he was bald, you know, that thing that we've all created that like, well, if your father's fault, like you, you can convince your son, oh, you're going to be fine because your father-in-law had hair. That's because we've your created- Your grandfather on your mother's side. Right. Yeah. Whatever the rules are, you know, oh, you, you're going to be blue eyed because of whatever. And then all of a sudden we have this anomaly where it's like, well, none of our kids ended up blue eyed and everyone is blue eyed in our whole family, except none of our kids ended up blue. What happened? What happened? What well, isn't a DNA? Bald people are the last group of people that you're allowed to make fun of like that. I agree with you. Let's chew on this bone. Bye. <laughs> well, hey, while we're in this intellectual vibe, why don't you kick over a question that we can deep dive into? A super philosophical question. If you could only wear one type of shoes for the rest of your life, what type of shoes would it be? Birkenstocks. You love your Birkenstocks. You can actually pull Birkenstocks off with a nicer dress. Uh, I've seen you do it. Uh, if I could only wear one shoe for the rest of my life, if I could only wear one shoe for right. the rest of my life. That is the question. I guess actually it wouldn't be Birkenstocks. It would probably be some hold kind on, of on, really on. comfortable. Hold, no, no. I, I, no, I've got to think about this. The rest of my life, we're in Fury Road. Uh-huh. Am I wearing Birkenstocks? No, I'm not f***ing wearing Birkenstocks. So you're going to wear Doc Martens That's the rest exactly of your right. white life and just in case Fury Road happens? That's what's happening. No. Nah. I have settled on hiking shoes because we'll go on saying. a hiking, hiking kind of thing. Yeah. Like a recent trip to Arkansas. Yeah. Bought a new pair of hiking shoes. Those yeah. have become pretty much my everyday yeah, shoes. I agree. You've got to find a pair that you can wear as an everyday shoe that doesn't look nerdy and doesn't you know fall apart or, you know, hiking shoes for me. So when we're creating the new world where everything's lovely and we're not doing Fury Road, okay. but instead we're like skipping through it's the dandelions. It's Birkenstocks every day. No, it's some awesome Keens. So we can go hiking and, you know, walking in our, and if it gets a little cold and the nature, no problem. Our feet are perfectly protected by these beautiful hiking shoes that we wear everywhere we go. La, la, la. That figment of my imagination. Well, thank you so much for listening to another episode of Dinner Table Talks. We will be back next Monday with a fresh episode. In the meantime, hit us up on social media, send us an email, DM us, whatever. We want to hear from you. And we hope that you're enjoying the episodes as much as we enjoy creating them for you.